Today we'll be talking about the ideas of Marxism, fascism, and communism, how they affect societies, and how they have slowly but surely seeped into the free world. Are they dangerous? Is it something that we, we should be idolizing or something that we really want to enter the door in our culture? Or should we be fighting it off with everything that we have? If you live in the United States of America, we've all had the opportunity to go to school, to be educated, to uh, buy and sell freely, exchange ideas. But is that possible in a society like a Marxist society, like a communistic society? I hope you were able to watch my previous episodes with Dr. Bernard Mauser on socialism and social justice. We'll be getting into even deeper here with the concepts that flow from socialism. So if you haven't watched them already, please go back and take a look at those episodes. Today, my special guest is Dr. Corey Miller. He is currently the president and CEO of Rosho Christi, is a Christian apologetic campus ministry. There are Rosho Christi organizations on hundreds of campuses all over the world. So it's a real pleasure and a treat to have Dr. Miller with us today. He grew up in Utah as a seventh generation Mormon and he came to Christ in 1988. Since then, he has served on pastoral staff at four churches and has taught nearly 100 college courses in philosophy, theology, rhetoric, and comparative religions at various universities. From 2009 to 2015, he served on staff with Cruz Faculty Commons Ministry at Purdue. He taught philosophy and comparative religions at Indiana University for 12 years. He's the author of several books and articles. Dr. Miller holds master's degrees in philosophy, biblical studies, and in philosophy of religion and ethics. His PhD is in philosophical theology from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland. He makes me feel like a lackey. <laughs> He's passionate about defending Christian faith, just like many of us. And that's why we're here, to learn more about how to engage in those conversations that count in our culture, even when it's changing at the pace with which it's changing. I'm Katherine Camp. Welcome to Faith and Culture. Let's get started. Well, hi, Corey. Welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here because there's so much to learn about Marxism and communism and socialism, uh, what we're all going through right now in the economy and how it's going to affect us personally, how it's going to affect our Christian faith, or is it going to be affected at all? But in the end, what we really want to know is what is the culture doing around us so that as Christians, we can best reach out to people who really begin to feel the pressure of their mortality and being lost and maybe not understanding things. So let's go ahead and, and start. I think uh, you mentioned we're going to talk about Marxisms today. Tell us what that is. I didn't, I've never heard that term, Marxisms. Yeah, well, uh, I'll hope to uh, disclose that over a couple of episodes, but in Marxism, you have uh, a variety of evolution of 
that idea, Marxism being the political ideology of Karl Marx and his um, co-worker, Frederick Engels. But then you have, you know, offshoots of it from Mao Zedong, uh, the revolutionary in China who coined the expression, a revolution is not a dinner party. <laughs> Think about that. Um, and then you have Vladimir Lenin, you know, state and revolution or his views on, on revolution. He was the one who launched the communist revolution, the Marxist revolution uh, in the early 1900s in Russia to become the Soviet Union. And um, then you have offshoots of Marxism that would be like anarchism. Uh, you would have uh, cultural Marxism, which uh, is where we want to end up thinking about where we're at today, because we are in this country living in no less than a cultural revolution. And in all the revolutions that I have studied, the Marxist revolutions, if you, if you can begin with the French Revolution, which it wasn't really a Marxist revolution, it was the one that Marx and Lenin looked at and said, that's the ideal revolution. It was bloody and it was effective in taking over an organ, mm -hmm. you know, a country, a, a people. Uh, wow. For their for their good, of course, right? For uh, whose good? For the people or for the leaders? Right. I mean, think about the People's Republic of China. <laughs> uh. You know, it's 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 for the people. Hmm. Yeah, and, and you're right. Ultimately, it is for the leaders. Uh, a good communist never ends up sleeping in the same uh, squalor and tent as the proletariat workers that he used to launch the revolution in the first place, right? Mm. So there are a variety of different Marxisms, and not all of them are revolutionary, uh, because the neo-Marxists, the cultural Marxists, we might look at as the failed revolutionary Marxists, because they were dominated by the fascists, didn't ultimately fail. They simply incubated and migrated to the West, and it's that neo-Marxism that we're now experiencing today. Not the okay. Leninism, Stalinism, or Maoism, but a different Okay. Um, can you define for people who don't know, I know they've heard a lot about fascism because Antifa, meaning anti-fascism, and here in the United States, we're just not really mainstream familiar with that term. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, you mean uh, fascism? The fascism. Of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, fascism... It brands itself as a sort of socialism. And so the two fascist regimes that we saw, uh, national socialist regimes that we saw, where Marxist ideologues were dominated, were in Germany and in Italy. So under Hitler and Mussolini, for example. So the Nazi party is, is called the National Socialist Party, right? And so... Fascism is a form of socialism different from communism insofar, insofar then as it's a, a kind of a big government socialist, uh, centrally planned economic system and ideology, uh, it is socialist, but it is nationalistic in its geographical borders and it is um, uh, centered more internally than communism. I guess you might you might look at um, how everything relates to ownership, right? Uh, so um, a communist system is state-owned, state produces everything, state decides how everything is produced, and how it's all distributed in a redistribution. Fascism, uh, well, let's start with free market. Uh, economy we call capitalism. Marx called capitalism. We might better yet call it free market systems. But uh, ownership is private. Uh, what gets produced is privately decided by the business or individual. How it's produced is private by the business or the individual. Right. And how it's distributed. Fascism combines a little bit of those um, in that it allows private property. Um, the state determines what is produced, but fascism kind of how it's produced. And then the state largely how it's distributed. So the irony is we see, um, 
you know, certain socialists in our country today, like uh, AOC or Bernie Sanders, they might be headed more toward a kind of fascism than they are uh, a communism, except for the fact that they don't like borders. And so that puts them closer to the globalist socialists, the communists, than to the national socialists, the fascists. Hmm. And so co communism then would be a, a political theory derived from Marx that advocates uh, class warfare uh, leading to a society in which all property is publicly owned and each person works and is paid equally according to their abilities and needs. So it's a social redistribution. Communism is statism from top to bottom. Capitalism or free market is uh, private ownership and uh, production and distribution from top to bottom. And fascism sort of combines them. Hmm. Interesting. So um, I think I, I, I veered us off in a little bit of a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to Marxisms. Can, um, yeah. Go ahead and, and educate us. Yeah, so... I think I, I, I had a meme or a post that I put up a little while ago on Facebook. I think I sent it to you too. And it was shared almost 200 times. And it says seven things that every kid needs to hear. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. I'm listening. Communism has failed every time it was tried. And you've got what it takes. <laughs> um, I like, loved that one. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, it's funny and it gets the point across. Um, but most communists, I remember in graduate school at Purdue, when I was taking a class on Marxism by a distinguished professor of Marxism, they like to say that, well, you know, you, you cite all of these places and say that it has failed. It's never really been tried, right? It's not been really tried in Venezuela or North Korea or China or Russia. All of those were mixed up with, you know, bureaucracy and bourgeois interests. And so it never really was tried. On the one hand, you want to say, yeah, right. On the other hand, there is a sense in which it's true. Um, because Marx um, saw history as moving in a certain direction. Marxism or Marxisms is a view about the good life, ultimately. Um, it is about utopia, the way things ought to be, even though he didn't really have an ethical system. Um, you know, many people think that Marxism has failed because in 1989, uh, the Berlin Wall fell, fell. But at the same year, the Tiananmen Square incident happened in China. And this past week, I was uh, had the pleasure of meeting one of the original uh, student protesters in that Tiananmen Square uh, now who's a pastor. Um, I've also seen the wall. I've met people who experienced what was behind the wall. Mm. People who have grown up in these communist-leaning societies. And when, when, Marx, when, when Marxists try and say that it was ne it's never really been tried, in one sense they're right. And it's because Marx had a view of history that went through kind of six economic phases. You have the you know, primitive communism, move to slavery, uh, a move to feudalism, where you had you know, the, the lords and the serfs, the, um, the nobility and the crown. Uh, and that was you know, what, what it was about in Russia with Lenin looking at the czar that had reigned for almost 300 years in that same family. So you have the feudalism of Europe and Russia. And then uh, it evolves into capitalism, uh, this view where there's this surplus labor, where everything is always wrapped up between the ownership of, of wealth and property and the worker. And the poor are always getting poorer on the back, and the, the, the capitalist is getting richer on the back of that poor serf. Um, and so there's the surplus capital, which is where the capital has come from. Well, he thought that, and he made predictions, and some were uh, failed predictions, and others tried to buttress those, uh, creating different kinds of Marxism and so forth. Uh, but capitalism was said to have its own internal self-destruction, so that it would evolve to the next stage, which is socialism. And socialism is where there is revolution 
on some level that takes place, um, the what Lenin called the dictatorship of the proletariat, where the workers of the world unite and finally throw off the shackles of the bourgeois, um, the ruling class. And then whether the anarchists or the Leninists are right, uh, that proletariat, that intermediate state of socialism, it too needs to be abolished uh, according by revolution, according to the anarchists, or it simply, as, a cor as Marx and, and Lenin thought, it would simply just somehow wither away into the final state, which is communist utopia that, you know, John Lennon and the Beatles asked us to imagine in his gospel song, Imagine, right? And so in one sense, yeah, we haven't gotten to that communist utopia yet. We're never told how to get there. We just know it's going to be very, very costly. And we need to keep trying until we get there. <laughs> and so you hear, you know, from various uh, of these members, uh, Gramsci in, in, in Italy, who was imprisoned by Mussolini, and whose father wrote the the works of Gramsci was was uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg in um, in Indiana, the presidential candidate. But he says socialism is precisely the religion that must replace Christianity. So for those people who think that socialism and Christianity are compatible, you got to think about that. Um, you know, Lenin said on his book Religion. Atheism is the natural and inseparable part of communism. That's on page one. It's the natural and inseparable part of it. How can Christianity then coexist? Um, Stalin said it, when he took power and wrote this book in 1932, The Five-Year Plan of Atheism, he said that by, uh, I think it was by May of 1937, there should be not a single church left within the borders of the Soviet Russia, and that the idea of God uh, will have been banished from the Soviet Union as a remnant of the Middle Ages. Uh, Mao Zedong said that uh, we will substitute materialism for idealism and atheism for theism. Clearly, it was about atheism. Chavez said socialism is the way to save the planet. Capitalism is the road to hell, and we can see how that ended. And then finally, uh, to kind of bring it all together, uh, Marx himself in the Communist Manifesto, and, and we need to take care, Catherine, to think about this, that when people think, ah, you're talking conspiracy theory, communism's dead, it's, it's over there, only, you know, Kim Jong-il continues to operate in that way. No. Apart from the Bible, the Communist Manifesto is the most sold book in human history. It, asks, it offers competing narrative of where history is going. And Marx said this at the beginning of the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. The theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. There are besides eternal truths such as freedom, justice, etc., that are common to all states of society, but communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality instead of constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experiences. So communism, the theory by Karl Marx, a political ideologue, is about the abolition of private property, of morality, of eternal truths, of all religion. And those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's that is so true, and that's why I I am we're doing what we do. Um, you are busy on college campuses, and I'm trying to reach people through these uh, video series. Um, it's so important. I, I think a lot of uh, today students today I know <laughs> I know too many of them that actually believe that the uh, Black Lives Matter movement was actually like about, you know, African Americans Black or <laughs> dark skin right. people right. when they have done nothing to help them. You don't even have to scratch the surface very hard to find what they, they stand for in their manifesto, not what the media tells you. I call them the propaganda media now. Uh, it's not what they're telling you, but if you actually look at their manifesto, 
They want to break up the family. I mean, everything that you just kind of said, they need to break everything up. No private property. Uh, it, it's right there. And, and so, and of course it's, it's made billions of dollars and made those, the three women who started it very wealthy, <laughs> wealthy right. enough to buy million dollar homes all over the place, mm -hmm. but no neighborhoods that they burned down ever got a penny of that. And neither did uh, struggling uh, African-American families. So it, it had nothing to do with helping or elevating anybody but themselves. Um, yeah, and like you say, right. it's like, it, it's the ruling class that continues to be uh, fine and everyone else is going to suffer. That's right. And I think that, um, you know, Marxism is very clever in that it offers people a vision of the good. Um, I think it's taken root in our culture so quickly and successfully because uh, it does what you know I'd like to get into in another episode eventually and how it invaded the West, but it capitalizes, if I can use that term, um, on the uh, sentiments of the West about true freedom, about religion, about about justice. And Marxism is ultimately, it is a religion in terms of it being something of ultimate concern. You know, Buddhism is a religion yeah. and it is non-theistic. So uh, being a religion doesn't require the belief in a God if Buddhism is a religion. And Marxism certainly has a competing vision of the good, but it, it capitalizes on uh, religious sentiment about concepts of justice and injustice. And so you look at the crises, you know, when you first read uh, Marx's Das Kapital, uh, you see what was happening in, you know, the uh, 19th century and the Industrial Revolution. And and there was some squalor that uh, came along with that. No one has ever said that, you know, capitalism is a, is a perfect system. Um, but along with that, you know, the, the trajectory was that it is all and only bad and that employees are always the slave of their employer. And so capitalizing on those notion of slaves in America has been, I think, very effective. Yeah. Do you think that um, with your uh, what you've studied on um, the, the Marxism that we're talking about right now, that they're trying to break down different classes and looking at capitalism and a free market that they have introduced this because I know from what I see of, I guess it's the people ages between, I would say 25 to 40, that there is some sort of a class struggle or division. There's a, a dislike of very wealthy people. And that's why we've been hearing a lot of politicians. I know for my adult life, trying to say, oh, you know, we've got to overtax these really wealthy people. And everyone's, you know, cheering on, yes, of course, do it. And <laughs> anyhow, I'm just wondering, because I know that, that some of their tactics are to divide people. They, they divide and conquer. And I feel like they're doing that here. And the class thing hasn't worked lately because everybody's been doing well. Um, even our poorest people here right. are are wealthier than 96 percent of the you know poor people all over the world um yeah. so they've gone to race you know these these uh race revolutions now yeah that's right and and that would be um a neo kind of marxism that um i hope to discuss in a, a future episode um but yes they start to um micro analyze across the board, these various classes. And so Marxism proper in classical Marxism uh, focuses on the economic theory, right? And you've got the bourgeois and the proletariat. And so okay. you get your pitchforks, you get your torches, and you go out and you find the rich guy, the owner. 
and uh, not realizing how much it's changed today where, you know, owners are 401k owners, right? The employees now are owners of the corporation. So much has changed, but people don't get that. But mm -hmm. uh, even in Mao, you know, when you read uh, Maoist Marxist writings, um, you know, you go after the richest 1%. But then once you once you've got people focused on that, you problematize that, and you create an enemy. Um, you find an enemy, then you can enlarge it and go after the two percent, and then the five percent, and then the ten percent, and and then the forty nine percent. And so there's no stopping. And eventually, when we get to discussing race, there's even a spectra of color too, not just white privilege, but brown privilege, and you know maybe something for the future. But yeah, the you know, the, the market-based systems, I think there's a, uh, this is where people don't pay attention to George Santayana. They don't remember their past. They're condemned to repeat it. They don't even know what capitalism is. They just hear that it's a bad thing. And so 70% of millennials and Gen Z regard socialism in, in positive thinking and thinking, you know, that it's going to provide greater security, unity, and, and yeah. equality. Yeah. Um, but they don't, they don't, Marx didn't understand economic systems well, and neither do the followers today. Um, we probably would be best to call it, you know, market-based systems um, because capitalism is emotive and misleading and things have radically changed. As I mentioned that, um, you know, the workers owning companies today have 401ks, um, making the workers today also the capitalists. And as you pointed out, our poorest people are, are rich. Um, capitalism has brought 4 billion people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we still have billions left to go, but so much greater than what socialism has done. And it's simply because it's based on what um, um, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, right. talked about as God's invisible hand. It's, it's something that is natural to the supply and demand way that market economies work, that um, you know, you have producers, you have consumers, and the producer comes up with a good or a product at a price that is agreeable to the consumer, and they call that the value exchange. And both are pursuing their own um, self-interest, but uh, self-interest, you have to question is, you know, is that a bad thing? And so Smith made this statement. He says, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect to get our dinner, but from regard to their own self-interest. The butcher, the brewer, and the baker all have self-interest in competing for certain things, but because of that competition and other virtues that fall out of it, that maybe we'll discuss in a little bit, virtues of capitalism, uh, it makes the world, by and large, a better place. Um, Everyone's pursuing self-interest, but is self-interest necessarily a bad thing? Right. And and you also, I, I feel like you get a lot more variety to choose from because everyone is free to to create and and engage in the economic system. Right. I think, you know, when we when we look at um, maybe certain virtues that we can see in uh, capitalism. There's a good book that I would you know, recommend to your listeners, uh, The Virtues of Capitalism, A Moral Case for Free Markets, uh, or if they wanted, you know, um, uh, from a, a Christian standpoint, a uh, recent book out by a University of Chicago economist, um, uh, socialism and capitalism. What does the Bible have to say? Those mm. are two good ones to to consider. Yeah. Um, but you know, benefits. You know, not only has uh, capitalism as an economic system provided the greatest production of wealth for the world that it has ever seen, including bringing more poor out of poverty, while the rich get richer, but the poor get less poor as well. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it offers freedom and creativity, um, initiative, cooperation, civility, responsibility. It produces several virtues that socialism uh, does nothing for any of those. It, it seems to make us poorer economically, but poorer on the scale of 
flourishing human beings too, because it it makes people perpetual recipients rather than participants in wealth creation. You know, this statism is nothing but wealth redistribution. The, the state does not make wealth. It only um, takes wealth in socialist systems. Right. I heard somebody recently, I don't even remember who said it, but they said, um, if you're looking for equity, that's a race to the bottom. <laughs> if you're looking for equality, that's your way, getting your way to the top. <laughs> I thought, okay, okay, think about that. It's true because equity means everybody, they have to take from everybody to give equally. Uh, and yeah. equality, you know, we, we work at other things to, I guess, be, be fair and, and virtuous to each other. Yeah, and I think that's um, one move that's happening right now, again, in contemporary neo-Marxism in the West, is this push for equity. Uh, but even equality, very interestingly, um, is something that somehow has been misunderstood and smuggled in. Um, Lenin says in his book, State and Revolution, democracy means equality, right? So we hear this pushed by neo-Marxists about equality. Uh, we also hear that we're a democracy. We're not a democracy. That's a, a political system that Aristotle, for example, hated. It's a, it's a mob rule, which is worse than a tyrant rule. Um, we are a republic, race publica, uh, the public thing, the law. We are a constitutional republic governed by the law, not by a mob. Uh, the law rules as king. So we're not a democracy. But democracy means equality. The great significance of the proletariat struggle for equality and of equality as a slogan will be clear if we correctly interpret it as meaning the abolition of classes. So how we get to that equality is kind of along the lines. It's the evolutionary conscious development, we might say, uh, about how to ultimately emancipate us from our, um, our slavery, uh, from our proletariat um, alienation. The worker is alienated from himself when he is subordinated by other people in this class conflict, in this conflict theory. And so we need to abolish all classes. And of course, in classical Marxism, among the Marxism, Marxisms, the focus was really on the, the economics, but even Marx had the seeds that it wasn't ultimately, you know, about economics. Um, you know, we get, you know, in the West, one of the things that's criticized, of course, is capitalism. Um, but this has a derivation, you might say, from Christianity. A very recent book and a very good one uh, by Benjamin Friedman, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism. Um, this wasn't something that a lot of liberal atheists, not illiberal Marxist atheists, but the classical liberals who are fighting against today's cancel culture, uh, like Steven Pinker at Harvard, want to make the case that capitalism derived from the Enlightenment values of humanism. It did not. Uh, it has religious core behind it. Um, and this is why um, the neo-Marxists uh, who criticize nationalism, who criticize uh, Western colonialism with its capitalist push, ultimately go back to the meta narrative of, of the Bible where it comes from, right? I mean, capitalism, I wouldn't say is the biblical model. The Bible doesn't set forth um, a, an economic biblical model for all time. It does give principles, but uh, much of the criticism has been misplaced. So let me mention uh, four of them, um, and then people can jump into those books for uh, greater elaboration. Right. Capitalism is all about greed, right? Even if it involves self-interest, is it really about greed? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in Thessalonians to look not only after your own self-interest, but after the interest of others. Self-interest is not the same thing as selfishness. Self-interestness, self-interestedness, is part of that uh, invisible hand of God that um, 
um, was talked about uh, in 1776 by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. Right. Greed is in socialism too, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's everywhere. That's it's a human human nature kind of thing. It's built into us. Uh, yeah. It, I mean, it's, it's a tendency that we can have, but we can also control it. Yeah, it's a spiritual problem. It's not an economic problem. Right. One man's greed is another man's envy. Um, the, the number two is that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer is based on a philosophical outlook of uh, what we might call the zero-sum game or the zero-sum fallacy of the socialist pie, which assumes that the pie is necessarily fixed. So, Catherine, if you have a larger piece of the pie and I have a smaller piece, uh, it means that, as Obama said to Joe the plumber, you didn't earn that, right? Um, somehow you stole that. Somehow inequality entails injustice. Uh, number three, capitalism leads to an overconsumption or to materialism. Again, that's a spiritual problem, not an economic one. And changing systems doesn't resolve that. And then finally, number four, what I already mentioned that uh, capitalism leads to inequality. Look, the rich do get richer in capitalism. That that's absolutely true. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that the poor get poorer. You know, biblically, it's um, the possession of wealth is not the problem, but it's obsession, and it it, it provides a greater opportunity for generosity too. Um, the assumption that inequality is injustice is false. God never says in the Bible that he hates inequality. We're never even told that equality is a virtue. We're told that justice is. He hates injustice and he hates oppression. Mm -hmm. Right. What I noticed, what I was hearing, you know, after all of those Antifa and BLM riots that were happening last summer around this time, you know, it started to, to uh, ramp up, that the whole goal was to really, and also that all these shutdowns, mm -hmm. the, the people that were really hurt were the middle class, the, the small business owners, mm -hmm. uh, because they were forced to shut down while the bigger stores were allowed to stay open. And if the people I've, I've heard talking about it, who seem to see a larger agenda at hand here, um, were pointing out that 82% of our GDP comes from small businesses. So if, if you can wipe those out, you can start to have an upper class and a, a, an impoverished class, which makes people easier to rule at that point. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? That uh, what, What's the specific question? As, as far as us going towards or being pushed towards a more socialistic or a totalitarian or communistic kind of economic system where they're they're really pushing this equality or equity of um, yeah. the americans actually the world i mean it's all over the world well and that's what distinguishes yeah that's what distinguishes you know notice all these are in red <laughs> right <laughs> Um, behind me in red, uh, blood and the, the red army and red and the devil. Another great book recently, uh, the devil and Karl Marx. <laughs> I've heard of that one. Yeah. Uh, by Paul Kengor. My son's going to be studying under him next year, but you know, he opens with a poem of Marx, uh, the thus heaven I forfeited. I know it full well. My soul once true to God is chosen for hell. That's the rail road paved to this utopia. Mm. Um, part of the problem in this right globalist socialism as opposed to Hitler's and Mussolini's nationalist socialism is that it knows no borders and that's why we always talked about stopping the spread of communism by definition it is anti-nationalist okay. uh, it is anti-colonialist and that's where that language it comes from today it is globalist it is about redistributing the global wealth of the world and so insofar as we find our politicians doing that and claiming some socialistic infatuation you have to wonder where they're coming from but but yeah it's um i mean a part of the problem with this system as a system is that it de-incentivizes wealth production 
you know, as I've taught for a dozen years at places like Indiana University and Purdue, when I uh, teach an ethics class, I will uh, talk to them about how I just graded their last exam. And I'm really discouraged, but I'm really empathetic. Um, you know, I realize that there is a bunch of inequality there, that some people have had charter schools and private schools and maybe private tutors. Others have had public schools and growing up in, um, you know, in squalor conditions. And, and because of that, it's just not fair that I give them some of them A's and some B's and C's and D's and F's. And so I said the average grade was a B minus. Um, therefore, what I'm going to do uh, for all future exams is I'm going to give you all B minuses. How many are, are up for that, right? No one on the top half raises their hands. Yeah. Um, the bottom half, they raise their hands, but it's equal. Now, I don't want to go after the 50%, remember. I want to start with the 1% or maybe 10 or maybe 75%. So I'll say, you know, I'll be more generous than that. You've tried hard. Uh, we're going through difficult times. We're going to give you all B pluses. How about that? Now I've got the majority in my class um, going with this. And then I say, I think that that sounds fair in, in light of the inequalities of opportunity. Um, we need to be able to pursue some equity here in light of uh, some of the um, inequalities of the past. And I, then I said, but let me ask a question. What will that do to you who are A students? Will you try harder for the next exam? If I do that, none of them raise their hands. Yeah, yeah. And I say, how about you F students? Will you try harder? <laughs> they laugh, of course. <laughs> Why should they? They're going to get a B plus. Right. I ask the D students, same thing. I ask the C students, same thing. B students, the same thing. What that tells me is that virtually every student is not going to try harder once we give a equal redistribution in terms of equity, it de-incentivizes excellence and human flourishing. Um, it does not help with the um, dignity of the human being to make them into what America has become and what a lot of uh, nations in the West have become, not socialist per se, but welfare states, right? Uh, the move towards socialism, but they're not fully socialist yet because government doesn't control the means of production. But it doesn't help. It makes the world poorer, not more wealthy. Uh, it is socialism that is the road to hell, contrary to Hugo Chavez. Look at his country. I, I heard about that and something, what you're describing, pretty much what happened in, in South America in, in some of those areas like Chile and um, Venezuela, where after a while, there was no incentive to really do any work and people would come. And I, it, I'm just, um, just saying what the uh, commentator, the person narrating the, the documentary said that they would come to work and just do crossword puzzles. They're just getting their check. And so what right. it did is, it, because everything was state owned, the whole country began to to fall um, economically. They had their GDP, and there was no growth at all. It completely stunted it. In fact, it made it worse. And um, and it went on to talk about India and and the problems there when they had uh, really hardcore socialism and you know, raise their tariffs or, or no tariff, you know, they weren't allowing for trade. Anyhow, it was, it was very interesting to see. It just, it will destroy an economy because there won't be any incentive to do anything because you're already getting a paycheck. It's like what we're going through right now. I, we've had uh, these little businesses starting to try and open up here in Virginia. And some of them, if these popular little restaurants, we've, we've gone to them and they're closed because they can't find any employees mm -hmm. because everyone was still getting, was so happy getting their stimulus check. And I was like, this is ridiculous. 
What, what are people thinking? I would rather work for my money and not be dependent on, on the government because that is, that is not, it's so volatile. It, you can't depend on that at all. <laughs> right. Um, well, I think that somehow the government uh, is more efficient or effective or more compassionate uh, with monetary funds. Again, the Bible does come out against oppression. It does suggest that God has a heart for uh, the poor and the oppressed and the downtrodden. Yeah. Uh, but nowhere do we find this concept that uh, equality, especially coerced equality, is somehow a virtue. Justice is a virtue. But fairness is never mentioned in the Bible as a virtue. Um, even with the founding fathers, when we talk about equality, we're talking about equality as it resonates with freedom, that uh, no external force ought to have the ability to coerce um, me as an independent agent, having equally the, the freedom to operate as a person endowed by its creator with unalienable rights of life, first of all, liberty or freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, these political and economic freedoms, which were often ascribed to the Enlightenment, derived previously from the Protestant reformers making you know, religious freedom decisions mm -hmm. enshrined in the founding documents, right? Um, and so the Bible gives the the marching orders, and it begins with um, uh, humans being created in God's image with inestimable dignity um, to be left alone, but also some, some uh, not just negative ethics, but positive ethics. But one of them is not coerced redistribution or, or theft, despite the fact that Raphael Warnock, the now Senator Warnock uh, of Atlanta, of Georgia, Georgia said that the early Christian church was socialist. Yeah, they use that Acts, um, that passage out of Acts where everybody shared everything in common. And that is just completely taking it out of context because yeah. people were still allowed to own land and they didn't have, they weren't forced to give. It was completely different. It was a virtuous thing. You gave what you wanted to, not forced. Right. And that's where, um, you know, the, the Jew, Karl Marx, was not a good Jew. <laughs> he rejected his Judaism. He rejected um, God's existence. And um, he nonetheless was influenced by it. When you read even in Lenin um, of the statement from each according to their ability to each according to their need. There is a cursory reading of biblical passages, and this is where Raphael Warnock tells us it's right there in the Bible. Read your Bible, right? And of course, we see the early church getting together, and they they distributed uh, to all who had need. But you're absolutely right; it was not involuntary giving; it was charity. It was those who followed the best Jew, Jesus saw that at the heart of a Jesus-centric worldview was to be a giver. He gave his life. Uh, it is why uh, the hospital movements, most of them in America, have the name Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Eliezer, uh, Good Samaritan or whatever. It doesn't have, you know, Karl Marx or Richard Dawkins or Bill Gates on the hospital. Thank goodness. I'd never want to go to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or... For good reason. Um, you know, in those, those passages in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, um, that each one gave as they had ability so yeah. that there were no needs, yeah. they presupposed property rights. Even in Acts 5, when Ananias and Sapphira got killed, it wasn't because they retained some of their own ownership. Yeah. Yeah. The text tells us why. Yeah. It, it says that they could have kept it, yep. but God um, went after them because they lied. They about lied. It. And they tried to virtue signal, as it were, which isn't courage, it's cowardice. Gee, 
Um, <laughs> Never heard them. that one before. Right? <laughs> they tried to show oh. the world that they were good people. Meanwhile, putting the money right back in their pockets, right? Yeah. Uh, and and private property, contrary to the Jew Marx, who wanted you know in one sentence to you know define communism, the abolishment of private property. Um, private property is presupposed in the Ten Commandments in Commandment eight and ten. So again, property is a good thing. It's so a, once yeah. We understand that ultimately my view of ownership is construed as stewardship. But nonetheless, it's my sphere of responsibility uh, to own and to create uh, more with the, as the parable says in the New Testament, to, to take what um, the landowner has given me and go and double it. Go create more wealth from yeah. the opportunities that I've been given. That is praised. It's it's not blamed. Yeah. You also mentioned, it, it is, it's important and it shows, I don't know anybody who doesn't want their own place. Uh, and that's, they should never be made to feel guilty. Even God distributed property um, to the, the different tribes of Israel as a blessing and, and it wasn't it so that they could own something you mentioned that i hear a lot about this that the goal is some sort of utopia mm -hmm. and uh, obviously we know the real utopia that they're looking for is being in heaven before god uh, they're trying to create that heaven on earth scenario in a sinful world uh, can you speak just a little bit to that? Because I know it's about time to let you go. But Right. Um, yeah, the, the goal is utopia. Um, Marx saw the conditions of his world and thought, this is, this is bad. It ought not be this way. Right? Mm -hmm. In a future episode, I think we'll take a look and see that Marx didn't ultimately care about people being impoverished. Um, Marx was ultimately not an economist, and everyone knows that. It's his failed predictions. He didn't understand how economics really works. Um, he was a philosopher, and he began with atheistic assumptions about the world and about human nature, um, you know, thinking if you redistributed to them, no one would compete. Everyone would have a Toyota, the same Toyota. Um, the beaten and broken down Toyota, of course. <laughs> right. Um, right. But everyone would have the same thing and then no one would want to compete. But he envisioned a world uh, without borders, a world without religion, a world without authority. Even the state eventually must be abolished. The family must be abolished. And somehow people are going to operate just like the Beatles song. You know, imagine. And go back and read that, listen to that song, look at the Lord in that song. Uh, it's a vision of the good life. He never tells us how to get there except by revolution. It will not happen by reformation. And that's why you hear about not police reform, but reimagining a world without police, defunding the police and so forth. Okay. Getting rid of authority, ultimately. This view of utopia um, even Lenin tells us Marx didn't know how to get there. Lenin didn't know how. The idea by a contemporary and former Marxist is that we'll figure it out on our, on our own. Uh, the oppressed people who are going through the revolution, we will figure it out when we get there. Um, it's going to be costly, but no one said uh, getting an omelet comes without breaking eggs. Did he say that? No. Or are you saying it? <laughs> he said that, but as, as Mao said, a revolution is not a dinner party. Okay. Right? Yeah. It, it's, it's a shame because they're driving you away from God, doing away with religion. Because, yes, uh, that does create division only in the sense of because it's they're not equal. Faiths are not all equal, as you know. Um, and the, the one thing that they're trying to, to take away is the one thing that can get us to a utopia, which is heaven. And it's what we all look to as, uh, obviously, as, as people, but 
especially as Christians, because we're, we're the only faith that assures people that. Um, all the other faiths, it's a work-based system, unfortunately. Right. And in some of the best ethical systems, like uh, I think in Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean Ethics, perhaps the most famous normative ethical system in writing, 2,400 years old. Uh, he was a Greek who had a vision for the good just by uh, making observation and seeing uh, how virtue is developed and uh, looking at the good for man, uh, the, the good life. Uh, without having revelation, he came pretty doggone close. Um, but even in his own ethics, he mentions the word God twice as much as the word for happiness, which is the purpose for the Nicomachean ethics. This end of man, this happiness to be like the gods, was a godlike life, according to Aristotle. Mm -hmm. And his uh, predecessor, or sorry, his his. Um, Proteges in the religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, like Al Farabi and Moses Maimonides and Thomas Aquinas. I wrote my dissertation on that uh, that comparative exploration. Um, they took that and ran with that and improved on Aristotle's system about the good life. But it always required God. Our our ultimate telos, our ultimate end, our ultimate goal is wrapped up in our understanding of the theos, mm -hmm. theology. But yeah. think about think about the first four letters there of theology of theos is theory, this theory, this critical theory that began with Marx is a God perspective view of the world, but not one that the good life is God like it's godless, and somehow even without a ground for ethics, without a ground for free will, or praise and blame for reward and punishment. Somehow we're supposed to imagine John Lennon's vision of the good without all of this stuff and the road to get there. It seems so peaceful in that song. All you need is love. You need death. Destruct love is love. Death. Yeah. yeah, it is not the view of the good life. The, the other Jew, the more faithful Jew, the Jew who knew Jesus knew best about the good life and, and how to guide us there. And that good life ultimately uh, includes not only the existence of God, but central to the Christian experience was the knowledge of God, John 17. Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating. What is the topic you'd like to touch on next time? I think next time we could get into um, Marx and his view of religion, his okay. uh, his religion of revolution and uh, his view of what he thinks about religious people and what should come about uh, of religious people in his utopia. Okay, that's going to be really fun <laughs> and, and educational. So I hope everybody keeps an eye out for the next episode and uh, learn more and we'll see you later. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Catherine. Good to be with you. Bye-bye.